Hi, I'm Andy Robinson, Head of Valuations for Deloitte. We recently hosted Professor Aswath de Morderin at our London campus. We asked Professor de Morderin to speak to us because he has an interesting and modern perspective on valuation, which we share. We don't always agree with everything he says, but I think you'll find some of his responses to my questions enlightening. So anybody who's involved in the deal obviously wins out of the deal. But in terms of the actual companies involved, the target company shareholders are the ones who walk away with a big chunk of the change. But there are some acquiring companies that over time can create value. But they tend to be companies that share a few common characteristics. The first is they tend to be disciplined. If they have an acquisition strategy that works, they tend not to deviate from it, no matter how attractive a deal might look. The second is they think about the price they pay a lot more than about the fuzzy stuff, the synergy, the control, all the neat stuff. The third is somebody is held accountable for delivering on the deal. So it's not just let's hope the synergy shows up. And the fourth is they actually plan for the deal before they actually pay for it and get it done. So there's actually a structure in place to make deals work out. It is difficult to stay disciplined, but if you can, there is a way to create value from acquisitions. When I first wrote about this in a, in, a, in a book about valuing what I call loose ends, and I called all these premiums, and I used the word arbitrary, and I got a lot of pushback from analysts and appraisers who used it, saying they're not arbitrary, they're based on data. For instance, a 20% control premium is based on data, but it's, it's a very bad reading of the data. And that's what makes them so difficult to push back against, is they're not completely arbitrary, they're based on what people think is data, but the data reflects either a sample that does not reflect reality, a biased sample, or reflects a history that no longer exists. But it is, I think, very insidious because I tell people the biggest enemy in valuation is bias because we all have preconceptions. And if you let these you know, premiums and discounts enter the process, you're going to find a way to feed your biases. I give them the simple example of what happens in entire process. In private company appraisal, for instance, Often you're valuing companies for tax reasons, so you're valuing companies for divorce courts. Your objective is to come up with as low a number as you can. So if you look at private company appraisal, there's a lot of discounting that happens. Liquidity discounts, private company discounts, control discounts. Whereas in acquisitions, your bias is to come up with a higher number. You've got to justify deals. You're seeing a lot of premiums there, you know, control premiums, synergy premiums. In fact, the same word gets used to justify both premiums and discounts, which tells me that it's something you're using as an excuse to push to a number. So given that we all have our preconception biases, and this seems to be an easy way to feed those biases, taking them out of the process is, I think, the best way to make our valuations actually mean something. I think we have to become less rigid and, uh, more, and less mechanical. We have to become more adaptable. The problem has never been with the models. The models we have are actually incredibly adaptable, incredibly flexible. So I think that we need to use our models. Well, I give the example of DCF. Many people, have, the version of the DCF that gets used in practice is a very rigid DCF. You have a 10-year time horizon, there's a growth rate of 2% you apply at the end of 10 years. You come up with the terminal value, you discount it back at a constant cost of capital, and that becomes a model used in every company. No, the, the DCF model is actually an incredibly, I've used it to value riders, users, subscribers, patents. I mean, I can use it to value so many different things. And there are so many layers to the model that we don't use. My suggestion to appraisers is to start using all those levers you've been avoiding for a long time. Let your cost of capital change over time in a DCF, it's okay. I mean, you don't have to use the same cost of capital, but if we're more adaptable, I think we'll become better at valuing things. And the challenge is the kinds of companies, the kind of assets we have to value today require that adaptability. I was talking to at a, at a, at a conference of hotel appraisers. These, uh, these were appraisers who value just hotels. They're very specialized. So one of them comes up to me at the end of the session and he says, have you heard of the Coke can approach to valuation? And I said, what's a Coke can? He said, what you do is you take, you, you see what a, a can of Coke costs at a hotel you're at. So if you're at a cheap motel, it might be at that vending machine, you pay a dollar. He says, you then add three zeros to whatever you have paid. 
you multiply the number of rooms in the hotel by what, so let's say you can get a Coke can for a dollar, you had three zeros, you get a thousand, the hotel is a hundred rooms, thousand times a hundred, so basically you end up with a million dollar value for the hotel based on the Coke can. So if you're in the Waldorf Astoria and you've got to get the Coke can out of that refrigerator in your room, it'll cost you 650, you do the same thing. And I thought he was joking, but I actually picked up a book on appraisals for hotels and this was, defi this was actually described in 20 pages as an appraisal technique. So when people talk about pricing multiples and they complain about this is an unusual multiple, I tell them, look, you know, people will, will attach multiples to pretty much everything, including Coke cans. So within at, at least customized appraisals, it's, it's amazing what kind of pricing techniques take form. But uh, it, it, it still remains as the strangest pricing technique I saw, but I guess some people use it. First, make sure you love doing this. I mean, otherwise it's going to frustrate you, it's going to anger you, it's going to lead you to bad places. So start from a, from a position of strength, which is you like valuing companies. And then work on your weak side. And I'm a great believer that valuations are combinations of stories and numbers. And often you come in with one of those skill sets more developed. You're either a natural number cruncher or a natural storyteller. And you want to feed to your strengths, which makes sense, but I think you want to feed to your weaknesses. You want to make your weaker side stronger. Because I think by being multidisciplinary, by being able to go across disciplines, I think you're going to get better at valuation. So come in for the, for the right reasons because you enjoy doing valuation. Work on your weak side and be okay saying I was wrong because if you're willing to say I was wrong and you're willing to change the way you do things, then you're going to be okay.